So tonight's talk is going to focus mostly on two figures of evangelism, very recent figures of evangelism. The first is Saint Nicholas of Japan, who did his work uh, around the turn of the 1900s, so late 1800s, early 1900s. And the second one is Father Daniel Sisoya, who was martyred only, I think it was 2009 off the top of my head. And he did his work in Russia and especially in Moscow. And the plan is that we'll be able to discuss these two figures in particular before we turn our attention to Australia and using a model that has been uh, devised by someone in their doctoral thesis to look at how spirituality has been received in Australia in the past and then we'll be looking to apply that to our own context here in Brisbane and in Southeast Queensland in general. But before we start, before we really start that, I think it's important that we look to our history. We look to the, the centuries that this church has been around, that the Orthodox Church has been here all the way back to Pentecost. And we see how Christianity has spread it's almost common that evangelism is seen as something that other people do, <coughs> as something that Orthodox people don't do, but others do. And others are, they don't give it a good name in, in, our, in our understanding, which is really unfortunate. It's what, we, what people often think of when you talk about evangelism, is what we would characterize as proselytizing, as offering inducements to convert or as getting baptisms for the sake of getting numbers but we weren't called just to baptisms at the end of matthew's gospel in matthew 28 at a um, at a part of the bible that we read at every single baptism we're told something very specific the followers of christ told to go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations Within that, baptizing them, teaching them. But to make disciples is what we're called to do, <laughs> what we as followers of Christ are called to do. So evangelism is not the problem. Bad evangelism is a problem. Evangelism that's not uh, bringing good news is a problem. So before we, before we move to the history, I'll give a sh really short two-minute video talking about the spread of Christianity, assuming my technology works. <coughs> so this one you can find on YouTube if you like, the spread of Christianity. I'll just play that now. See it blossoming, still, still under persecution, by the way. Christianity is still under persecution, and it's spread all the way to England and India here. Here's the Edict of Milan, the Ecumenical Councils. And it continues spreading beyond the empires, too. see the rise of Islam is taking out a lot of Christianity <clears throat> completely dried up over here before it returned the great schism happened just then and soon after that is when it's working its way up to Slavic lands the Mongols came and the Mongols went And it took until about the 1500s for it to for Christianity to spread across Russia. 15, 16, 1700s. Soon after that, it made it to Alaska, but it probably won't show up on this map. Australia just there. And that's where it was. That's the point it was just a few years ago. Where Christianity, this isn't Orthodox Christianity, this is Christianity, 
has spread through the world. Where Christianity has spread through the world. And here's a more static map. So this is a little before the Great Schism. We're hitting around the 800 mark. So the dark blue is around 300. Dark blue is 300. That date's important because it's before Christianity was legal. <clears throat> so the spread of the gospel still occurs even when it's not legal, even under persecution, even under adversity. It is still important to spread the gospel. Needless to say, not being under persecution really helps. And that's this area that I hope is light green. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Colorblindness kind of gets annoying in these kind of scenarios. Yes, it's thank you. Yeah. Aqua, great. Probably a little bit and it gets, aqua. by 600, it spans over here, goes over to Ireland. It gets a long way. And then at 800, a couple of centuries later, we just finished the Ecumenical Councils in 787. And after that point, between 600 to 800, we get Germany, um, pretty much modern day Germany, and I think that's the Netherlands or so, and England, as you can see with the Anglo-Saxons. So Christians were kind of pushed up to the outer skirts. And then uh, England had to be re, re evangelized. The geography of it needed to be re evangelized because it was a completely different people group. So before we go to these two case studies, let's have a look at our history. And it's necessarily going to be a flyover history because there is so much of it, as you saw, as you saw all through that. So there's a number of ways in which the gospel has spread. The first is that the boundaries of the gospel were pushed. And this was through the great men of evangelism, the great women of evangelism. <coughs> the apostles, the 12, the 70, the apostle Paul is normally numbered among the 12, but just to emphasize how far he went, I've listed him separately. They went from Kiev to Ethiopia and from England to India. That's a pretty impressive spread when you don't have cars. When all that you've got are um, horses and ships. You did have trade routes. And if you were someone who didn't carry a lot of stuff, then you could move pretty quick. But move they did. And across all sorts of cultures, so many more cultures than, than, than likely we would have today because of the, the effects of, of globalization and other things and how cultures are kind of sinking together. They didn't have any of that. So they were crossing cultures all the time, going to, um, going to distant cities in the same region may have different cultures. Subsequently, you had apologists. St. Justin's School was probably the first example of a, um, of a centripetal form of evangelism where you invited people to come to you. As we're going to see later, that's pretty much what we're using now. But it's worth noting that it wasn't the first that was that form of evangelism that was used. And it's certainly not the only one. <coughs> we have the Egyptian monks who went to Nubia. We have the Celtic monks who seem to go everywhere. Part of the uh, culture, I suppose, of the Celtic people to have a form of wanderlust. And that meant that, um, that though there was time within a monastery, those monks would also go walkabout. And when they went walkabout, they spread the gospel. So it's an example of a culture having parts that can be very easily Christianized. And so it was. Not only the, um, the places that we consider to be Celtic nowadays, but to all sorts of places in Europe. To, um, to Europe through the 5th to the 10th centuries and Scandinavia from the 8th to the 10th century. The One of the things to highlight is that is why Scandinavia took so long to get to. It wasn't because the Vikings were warlike. It was because it was difficult to get to. And so 
this teaches us that necessarily there will be priorities when it comes to evangelism. It has to be. To whom do you evangelize first? It's really tempting to say, we want to evangelize everyone. And as a dream, that's true. But you need a little more focus to make that practically possible. First, you reach the Frisians. I don't have a map. Germany-ish. And then you can go further and then further. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have priorities when you're trying to make something happen. Not because you want to limit yourself, but because you want something to succeed. St. Cyril and Methodius, the 9th and 10th centuries, their work looked like a failure. And if you looked very soon after they, their repose, you would have thought that it had pretty much failed. They went to Moravia, modern-day Czech Republic. Um, the, the fruits didn't take hold. Their disciples were invited to go to another country, and that's where their fruits took hold. And now we go so far as to call them the teachers of the Slavs. But at the time, we would have had no concept of that. Their big thing was that they used the local language. They even invented alphabets in which to do this. Which teaches us how important it is to use local languages when the purpose is to evangelize. The, and lastly here, or the Valam mission to Alaska. There's a lot of things that we can take from that mission, and um, and it's something that's very near and dear to us as we uh, as we have a relic of Saint Herman, which is very well traveled, from the far western side of Russia, the Valam Monastery. They traveled Russia through to Alaska, and this little relic, little small bone fragment made its way then to Australia. Very well-traveled fragment, that one. Um, it's probably the longest missionary journey made by land in history, I, as, as I understand it. They sided with the people and with their culture. They were there partly to provide a chaplaincy to the uh, Russian-American company. But they sided with the people who were working at the company and were often very unfairly treated. And they sided with them. And still to this day, Alaska is the state in the United States with the highest concentration of Orthodox Christians, despite many years of neglect, we have to say. But the way that they evangelized meant that Orthodoxy stuck. It became part of the culture. It became we might say, enculturated in, among the various tribes in Alaska. But it's not just the great figures. It's not just the ones that, that we read about in the Synaxarian and in the textbooks mm -hmm. and so on. The biggest way that the gospel was spread was by so-called ordinary people. They weren't pushing the boundaries for where the gospel was. These are places, for example, where a church may exist, excuse me, a congregation may exist. But how does that congregation grow? It grows through so-called ordinary people who are gossiping the gospel, who are telling people that they know. This is how the gospel spreads and becomes entrenched in an area, not just approached, but how it stays, grows root. It also became a state religion in Armenia, the Roman Empire, in, first in Armenia, then the Roman Empire in about in the 300s, and in Georgia, and many, many more following that. And it's worth pointing out, and I've come back to this a number of times, that in the Roman Empire, at 300, once again, before, the um, before it was legalized, before it was decriminalized, 10% of the empire was Christian while it was illegal. It was being spread by apostles and by missionaries, yes, but they didn't do it all. The lion's share of the work was done by 
ordinary people in parishes, so-called ordinary, who shared it with their friends, who shared the experience and the community and the faith in Christ with their friends and with the people that they knew. Our history also includes lessons, and it can't not. So um, our experience under communism was that persecution purifies. We see that the, the church in, in Russia today, as an example, is a, is a vibrant being. Certainly quite different to how it was a um, hundred years prior, or two hundred years prior, where you had issues with people saying that we shouldn't evangelize at all. You can imagine the response of people like St. Innocent of Alaska, who founded the Orthodox Missionary Society. Unfortunately, deep and widespread roots endure, shallow ones, not so much. So we, we talked about Russia as a example of the faith being purified. But if we look to the church in China, which was attempted for many years, which has given us hundreds of martyrs, but was really only around for decades and not centuries, and was much, much smaller certainly proportionally. And we see that the Cultural Revolution pretty much wiped it out. There were a few survivors, one of whom, uh, Father Michael Le, who was in Sydney uh, until his repose a few years ago. But the church itself in China was for all intents and purposes wiped. So just because there is persecution, just because martyr's blood is spilled, doesn't mean that automatically the church will grow. It doesn't lead to that. Uh, it can, but it doesn't automatically. Other things that we can learn, there are places in the world where there was Christianity, and there was specifically Eastern Orthodox Christianity, but it's not there anymore. So this could be for a variety of reasons. The rise of Islam was one of them, the split between the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox is another. The split between us and the Roman Catholic Church is a third. Uh, the Old Believer split in Russia and um, communism in China. All of those were, were where we once were and now, and only now are we starting to come back to. And lastly, there was the, the experience of essentially bribes for baptism. Now, we like to think that we haven't done that. But unfortunately, yes, it is part of our history. But thankfully, we can learn from that because it failed abysmally. It was in, I think it was the 1400s in Russia where people were enticed to be baptized so that they would be Christian, so that they wouldn't pay additional tax. Unsurprisingly, what happened when this was eliminated under Empress Catherine is that, the, is that the people reverted to what they had never really left anyway. They reverted to um, being predominantly Muslim, if memory serves. They reverted to their previous religion because they'd never really left it. So bribes for baptism, bad policy, bad, bad idea. I want to make that very, very clear. When we're talking about evangelism, that's not evangelism. The only good news there is, hey, good, you don't have to pay tax. <laughs> That's not good news in the Christian understanding. So we can learn from that, and we ought to. Okay, so before we move to St. Nikolai, any questions? No? We're all good? We just can't wait to get on to St. Nikolai. Yes, one question. Um, just a thing. With, um, say, a, a, an Orthodox person wants to marry someone who hasn't been baptised. Mm -hmm. Is that, to me, sometimes that looks like it's, you know, you're coming along to be baptised just because of me, not because you know about the faith. Yeah. Is that a form of... of of uh, sort of bribes for baptism? Hmm. 
I, 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 it's, to, me, to, to me, it looks like it. Yeah. Um, you are also keeping a family together. Mm. But that goes both ways, too. People choose to leave because of that, mm. just as often as people choose to arrive because of that. Um, I shouldn't say just as often, I don't know the statistics, but it no. does go both ways. And... Yeah, I, I suppose that you can call that perhaps baptism. I certainly wouldn't call it evangelism. Mm. Not not immediately anyway. Mm. Some people, all they needed to do was to hear about Orthodox Christianity and they go, this is actually what I've been looking for. Fantastic. And that's great. That is is at least close to evangelism, even if it's accidental. Um, but if it's just a matter of getting dunked as a to-do list... You know, you get engaged, then you get the wash, then you get the wedding. Yeah. And then you live your merry way and you don't go to church after that. You don't have any relationship with Christ after that. Then I'm not sure what the good part of good news you've taken on. Mm. So you've had the sacrament. Great. But that's certainly not what we're talking about here. When we're talking about evangelism, we're not talking about dating in order to get people to convert. That doesn't work either. Yeah. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> um, so that that's that's also not what we're talking about. Um, usually that comes as like a pastoral decision, which is you know, for another talk. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. All right. So Saint Nicholas. Let's get on to our very first case study. So he arrives in Japan in 1861. So he's about 50 years in Japan. And he, he, he arrives as the chaplain of the, um, the Russian embassy in Hakodate at a time when preaching Christianity was illegal and very much illegal, because, partly because Christianity had been used as a method of colonization. It had happened in other parts of Asia. And so the Japanese went, absolutely not. We are not being taken over by this stealth. But the embassy staff, cool. Yeah, it's you're not preaching to Japanese, so it's not a problem. And he arrives with the intent that it's a platform for missionary work. That's his plan the whole time. And so he spends the time. He spends it learning the Japanese language, learning the Japanese culture. Eventually, he writes a, a uh, Russian Japanese dictionary which is very, very highly regarded for decades afterwards. He became known as, as somewhat of a master of the Japanese language, which is difficult for native Japanese. But he, he was able to do that because he spent eight years doing the services at, at, at the embassy, but learning the language and learning the culture of the people that he yearned to bring to Christ. His first convert was a samurai who hated foreigners. And this convert was, future convert, I should say, future priest as well. He was there to teach the ambassador's son how to fight with a sword. You know, get a samurai to do that, that's probably, probably a good choice. And he hated this foreigner who'd be walking around in his robes on embassy grounds. And one time he challenged the um, father, as he was at the time, Father Nikolai, and um, said, you know, I should behead you. And this plucky little priest monk goes, shouldn't you hear what I have to say before you kill me? And he goes, all right, that seems fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> And so they, they sit down and, and Father, as he was, Nikolai, talks about Christianity and his scowl over time drops away. He gets out his notebook and starts taking some notes. He doesn't convert immediately, by the way, but he does eventually. And he starts bringing people to Father Nikolai over time. There were three original um, three converts in the first uh, baptism of the Japanese and this was still while Christianity was illegal but they had learnt of, of Orthodox Christianity and they wanted to convert and so after quite a long time they were, um, they were baptised a lot of rigmarole around it too they needed lookouts 
for example, to make sure that no one was going to come in while they were while they were performing the sacrament. Thankfully, in 1869, give or take, there was a cultural shift that was detected, and Father Nicolai saw this, and he said, "Right, we've got to take advantage of this." It still wasn't legal, but people were open to Christianity. So he devises rules for missionaries, and he traveled to Russia to ask for resources. That's important in a mission. You can't just do it off of goodwill. It does need to be supported. And his first converts actually began teaching in his absence. A letter was sent out by uh, who became Father Sawabe, and a letter was sent out to some disaffected samurai in Sendai, <coughs> of all places, in West Japan, saying, um, this is a vehicle for us to um, to get our sense of self back. And um, we've got this guy, he can teach you and, and all that kind of thing. And they went, all right, we'll, we'll come straight away, let's go. Unfortunately, um, Sawabe had intended that they, you know, come eventually, come in, a, come in a little while. So this um, unexpected turn of events actually made them more receptive. Because previously they'd come in their pride. But now they had to have a little bit of humility and, and talk to people who had re- only recently been converted, I mean, comparatively recently. But they did. And eventually many of them did convert. And so Sendai became a bit of a center for Orthodox Christianity. To this day, I believe it's the uh, second city, so the first city for a um, for a diocesan bishop in the Church of Japan. It would be Tokyo and then Sendai. At 1875, the, we have here the preaching stations from Hakodate right at the top, and you can see how out of the way the Russian embassy was. So when you see, when you read in the histories about how we should be in a more accessible location, they weren't wrong. Hakodate is on its own island, far away from what we might consider mainland Japan. So, he, But he did move down. Uh, the preaching stations were also at Sendai, at Sanuma in Tokyo, Nagoya, and Kyoto and Osaka. Which is not bad. Only six years <clears throat> after detecting a opportunity, he had all those preaching stations. No bullet train. No bullet train. <laughs> no shinkansen. <laughs> Nothing like that. Uh, it was just people walking and traveling by you know, some form of four-footed animal to get to where they needed to be. With thirty plus evangelists that he had, and these were often paid for. 30 plus evangelists, orthodoxy spreads. In Hakodate, the evangelists spread the gospel. One of the leaders there was one of the first converts, Sakai, who became Deacon John Sakai. Uh, He was actually put into prison, and they found that that was really counterproductive. It was like they had a Christian chaplain in there. (laughs) That was kind of awkward. Um, in Tokyo, so Nikolai actually moved here. So he moved down from Hakodate down to down to Tokyo. And he bought a site for a missionary school. Pretty low quality buildings, but he bought the best that he could afford. And, um, and he taught Russian by day, and he taught Orthodoxy by night. He was no doubt, he was paid for teaching Russian, which paid for him to teach Orthodoxy, which is what he actually wanted. Um, the government spies checked the content just in case there was sedition, um, treasonous material. But some of them actually converted, so it ended up being a good thing. Uh, in 1872, there were 10 secret baptisms, and they discovered the government knew. And imagine the, the, the terror that he had, that with these 10 baptisms he might be expelled. But no... He actually got more boldness because he discovered that the government knew they just didn't do anything about it. They didn't mind. It wasn't a problem. And so he actually got boldness from that. In Sendai, several were baptized and three evangelists were spread, despite 
Um, despite malicious rumours, despite imprisonment, the gospel spread rather well there. Um, there were 200 Christians by 1873, and in 1875, 129 of these were baptised. So they really had a good catechumenate, we should pause to note. That was two years. If you, if you massage the figures, it's no less than one year that they were waiting to be baptised. So quick baptisms, it's not our game. Because it doesn't matter how many people you baptise. What matters is how many disciples you make. In Sanuma, two merchants were intrigued, so an evangelist was sent. And uh, there were 53 baptisms in 1875, another 100 in uh, 1876, and then another 93 in the next year. And then they had a church built a couple of years after that again. So you can see that good buildings don't create conversions. They can be helpful, and we'll see a bit of that later on. But not necessarily. Certainly not necessarily. We had hundreds in Sanuma without a church, without a concrete structure dedicated for worship. In 1875 was the first native clergy, and five more followed in 1878. And finally, in 1880, Father Nikolai became Bishop Nikolai. Then he gets a lot of geopolitical problems with the Russo-Japanese War, and that, that actually does inhibit his progress. Uh, and it teaches us the, um, the challenges that can come from if the church is seen to be, doesn't even have to be actually, but even if it is seen to be entangled with, with foreign associations. That can cause very real problems. Um, there, were, there was uh, aid from the Missionary Society diminished, which meant that they had to reduce the number of paid evangelists and students, and St. Nikolai took this as a as a um, prompting that maybe we shouldn't be all about um, getting money from overseas to fund our missionary work. Good as that is, that's got to stop at some point, and it looks like it's stopping, so we've got to move towards self-reliance. And in 1912, Archbishop Nikolai reposed in Tokyo. Just a few statistics. So the this one's a little misleading, so I'll go through that first. So in 1878, just shy of 5,000. Five years later, we get, um, what's that, about 8,000. 1907, it's gone up to 30,000. And in 1912, at, at Archbishop Nikolai's repose, it was over 30,000, probably about 33,000. 1941, it seems to have reached its peak at 40,000. And between 1941 and 67 years later, it's gone back down to the, its uh, 1907 level of around 30,000 believers. So this can happen, that a church can grow and it can shrink. Passing on the faith is certainly not guaranteed. The priests and communities, and it will probably be interesting to correlate these figures, but the number of parishes and communities is very, very low at 2008 very close to the number of priests and evangelists though so it seems like they have as many um, parishes as uh, people able to staff them priests and evangelists to staff them but if you look to other figures like in 1907 there's this massive gap same thing with 1883 huge gap between the number of communities and the number of people able to staff them what that means i'm not entirely certain and we'd need to go with better than just the one case study to draw huge conclusions. But there's a lot of things that don't go together. Like bricks and mortar buildings doesn't necessar necessarily go together with successful evangelism. Even um, having parishes and communities, there can be way more communities than there are people able to serve them. And that can simply be part of the, um, part of the reality of evangelism. Because after all, the gospel spreads very much through ordinary people, not just full-time staff. And often full-time staff are the most incapacitated. Because it's, oh, you have something to gain. Or, oh, this is just your job. Well, you know, I could be doing something else. But put that to one side. Perception is very much on the side of the quote-unquote ordinary person. 
So there's some big things that we can learn. Big things that we can learn from him as a mission leader. His priorities were on translations and evangelism. That's the top priority. It wasn't beautification. Translations and evangelism. Because you need to translate it correctly if you're going to pass on the same faith. It's a very important thing. And you need to be passing on the faith. Not passing on um, beautiful music, not passing on beautiful iconography, but passing on the faith. After that came beauty, came beautiful singing, came beautiful churches, came a local iconographic tradition. That came later. Uh, he wanted to use all opportunities to build support for the mission. He noted that reason attracted the first converts. Beauty often attracted later converts. So, for example, he spoke to Sawabe and it, it was all sit down and discuss, and then he converted with Sawabe and the samurai sit down, discuss, and classroom kind of situation. Later on, you had people that were attracted to a particular style of singing because the Japanese hadn't really heard four part singing before. And the best place to hear four part singing in Japan at the time was in Nikoraido, the cathedral in Tokyo. And so they often went there for that. So you use whatever opportunity you have, but you use that opportunity to spread the gospel. The goal, St. Nikolai had a goal for his church in Japan, and that was an indigenous local church that was run by people of that area. Didn't mean immediately. In fact, he felt that the, um, that the church in Japan would have a foreign bishop for for a number of bishops, for a few generations, but that it would be traveling in that direction to have its own bishops, to have its own, certainly to have its own priests. That's something that he did very quickly. In fact, he was one of the few Europeans there most of the time. He had no more than <coughs> half a dozen to carry the work across Japan with hundreds of Japanese evangelists, no more than half a dozen Europeans. He did that by developing co-workers, particularly from those who converted. And he really needed to as well. Um, he developed all people. He delegated things where possible, stuff like catechism and evangelism and making clergy. He delegated that as much as, much as possible. Um, he used talents of others, but when their talents weren't used well or where they were in a position where they clearly weren't suited to. He also did make the call to move them to a different position, which was a very tough call to make, but he was able to make that well. He said that a mission leader must have pastoral love for all, especially fellow laborers, that, they, that the mission leader has to be accessible, at least to the rung below. So the bishop had to be accessible to his priests and so on. Um, he would need charisma, keen observation, perceptiveness, administrative acumen, um, information processing, the ability to keep records was huge. That's why we had those statistics in the previous slide. Uh, the, and the, the leader being foreign would necessarily have to combat homesickness and things along these lines. And they would combat that by their devotion to the task and by their love for the people that they were bringing the gospel to. He spoke about an effective mission because he found that serious growth can happen. It's all squandered unless you've got a plan for how to welcome people in. Translations, he found that formal is best and from scratch is better than trying to use heterodox works and bring them uh, into line with, with orthodox works. The Bible's the most important, then service books, then other edifying works. Uh, he, he used any available tool. This was his mission strategy. Use any available tool to bring people to Christ. This could vary what the tool was. It was anything that was respected by the culture. So if anime would be respected by the culture, then that would be a tool that can be used. And why not? Uh, if anime would not be respected, you put it to one side and say, we can't use that as a, as a tool right now. And you can't be attached to the tool that you use. Just because um, 
setting up a cross in the middle of a city and then talking worked for St. Cosmas of Aetolia, fantastic. But we ourselves know that that doesn't work here. It doesn't work in the CBD of Brisbane. We walk past those people and say, oh, don't identify me with them, geez. It's a very big, very big difference. So we can't be attached to the tool that we use, but we are attached to the result, or the, the intended result, rather. Where was I? I felt that enculturation was very, very important, and, um, and not having many people from overseas really helped that. Making sh he made sure that the church was indigenous, even as he wasn't, and he'd still speak Japanese, and fluently and well. But he would look different. And in a very culturally and racially homogenous society, that was, that was significant, that he looked different. But all, all the priests, the deacons, the evangelists, these would be Japanese. And so they would naturally create a Japanese church. When he wanted to put together the cathedral in Tokyo, he got plans from Russia. And then Japanese people built it, which made for a delightful fusion of architecture as the Japanese interpreted the, um, the plans into something that worked. And so you had a Russo-Japanese structure in, um, in the middle of Tokyo. We also needed ways to communicate with members, like newsletters and such, careful accounting, um, financial hardship, he noted, was an issue because Christianity often spreads among those without means, those who, who don't necessarily have the money to be financial stewards of a mission. And so that needed to, to be taken care of in another way. And also charity projects needed to be done, not for any evangelistic reason, although it did create goodwill, but because we're Christians. That's part of who we are to have that charity, to, um, to be giving to others. Lastly, the effective evangelist. We have more for us to learn uh, from that. So, an effective evangelist has to know the gospel and well. Um, anything else, an above average ability can be very helpful. So, public speaking, writing, um, building things, and more and more and more. An above average ability in anything else is helpful. You've got to know the Bible. You've got to know scripture. You've got to know the good news that you're preaching. Very important for an evangelist. They had to be focused and diligent. They had to persevere. They had to be humble. They had to accept strong opposition. As we saw with Sawabe, he was a samurai who wanted to kill him. But strong opponents, in this case, made strong ally, made a strong ally. And this can happen in the future as well. Uh, the effective evangelist has to know and to love and to be part of the local culture, including taking on local customs. That's a necessary part of that. Um, that's one of the ways that you show your respect for the culture. You show that, that, um, that Christianity isn't there to demolish culture, but is there to sanctify it that it might be a vehicle towards heaven. Evangelistic work, um, by default, one should actively preach the gospel. One should be willing to travel to the inquirer and should welcome all into the church. For Father Daniel Sisoyev, he worked in, he did his work in, um, mostly in Moscow. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, for like 80 years, was it 70 years? Anyway. Communism really attempted to, um, to exterminate, Sometimes. to demolish, and to uh, marginalize the Orthodox Church. And it took a lot of different ways of doing this that we really don't need to go into. But the point is that it, at this time, there had been 73 years of attempted destruction. So he's part of bringing, bringing it back, in, um, at least in the area that he was. The recovery only started in 1991. The, it was a national institution that hadn't failed, that hadn't become uh, communistified. And so there was a lot of attraction to the church. Even to this day, I hear of people who had been in the early to mid-90s 
Um, they walked into church because they were allowed to now, and the priest pretty much baptized them on the spot. <laughs> Sometimes a faith would grow from that, which is you know, wonderful to hear, um, but it's uh, rather quick. And you can imagine the lack of priests that they had. And just the ones who, who had survived communism, and that's it. That's it. Uh, and now they had to baptize one of the largest countries on earth in terms of, not only in terms of geography, but in terms of human population. And how do you baptize them all? They worked it out, but... Uh, now, 70 to 80% of Russians, that's 144 million, are baptized. Which is pretty good in, what, 17 years? 27, isn't it? Anyway... It's still imp impressive either way. It's the most believing country in Europe, but it does have a low rate of participation. So uh, it's important that we don't that we don't try gloating. Um, there are, there's a huge good that's come out of that, um, and also work to be done. And that's where Father Daniel came in. So he started his missionary work in 1993 when he was halfway through a degree. In his case, a Masters of Theology degree. He was made a deacon and he taught RE in high school. Uh, he ended up doing his thesis on Seventh-day Adventism. I'd love to read it if it ever gets translated. Um, he, was, he was blessed by the patriarch to hold biblical conversations with those who were influenced by sects and cults, which is uh, very appropriate can, given that he had defended a thesis on, on uh, one such sect. He published his first book on creation in 1999 and, and published articles on uh, creation and anti-sectarian issues. He was ordained a priest in 2001. Um, he was the secretary of a missionary educational center and continuing with his conversations. He began building a small church in 2005 where he was focused on expatriate communities who were living in Moscow. So he'd have little pamphlets and flyers in various languages, all the languages of the guest workers who were living in Moscow. Uh, his parish ran singing lessons, iconography classes, he ran a scout group. Um, the, he ran a catechetical school, which we're going to go into in a bit. He had an open house, open church you know, during the day, uh, and missionary courses and frequent prayers for the conversion of the non-Orthodox and also for frequent prayers for students at a nearby university. He was noted as a missionary, particularly among Muslims and non-pagans and, and Chinese, sorry, and non-Orthodox and for polemic performances. It was televised in debates against, um, against Islamic imams. He established a missionary movement which included training Orthodox street preachers who were very well received. And he stood out for evangelizing Muslims, baptizing about 80 and engaging in those public debates. As we said, in 2009, in November, he was shot in his church because he was successful in his missionary work. Uh, he's widely considered a martyr for the faith, including by, um, by the Patriarch, and the missionary center of Father Daniel Sisoyev continues his work. So there's three things that I can bring forward out of this. The first is that, once again, he had a plan, he had programs. Uh, there was a spiritual program with church services, uh, the standard weekend services, but at his parish, he had daily services, morning and night. Sorry, was he a monk priest or a... No, he's married. No. Um, he left behind three kids, I think, two or three. And they're, they're young too. So um, so the books that are sold go towards supplying, um, what's the word? Supporting. Money, supporting right. um, his, his wife and children. Um, but he had daily services. And um, he had other corporate prayer as well because he always had someone in his church praying. Now that person was able to break their prayer and help someone and welcome them in and give them church tours and things like that. There was always someone there. You wouldn't want to leave a church unattended. And this is a the <coughs> middle of, of a very large city. And when it comes to very large cities, you don't leave churches unattended, as you might in, in small rural areas. However, he had someone there, someone to welcome people, which is very important. Um, he... He was praying, he encouraged parishioners to pray, and he made the point that without prayer, there is no evangelism. There's no good that you're messaging. Prayer needs to be the bedrock of evangelism. He also had a missionary program, not just passive outreach, 
with websites and the fact that his church was there, but also active outreach, including advertising talks. He had a missionary school, which he taught to explain the faith from scriptures in relevant language. And he taught to preach to non-Orthodox, including Islam and theosophy and paganism and various cults. Uh, and this wasn't just a missionary school where you came and you listened to the talks and then you went home. It had standards. It had exams. Which is pretty cool. Like, passing his missionary school really meant something. It meant that you had studied, for one thing. And it meant that you could put things into practice. He also had a publishing program with a publishing house, prayer books, psalters, introductory books. As we mentioned before, these were in multiple languages because it, um, part of his work was for um, people from multiple cultures. His catechetical program is just breathtaking. He delivered five talks a week. Okay, three of them were sermons. Two of them weren't. They were uh, two-hour talks. So Thursday after Vespers was a Bible study. Two hours. Um, he focused on how the saints and the fathers interpreted the scriptures, and it was very successful. It attracted inquirers, catechumens, um, even clergy from other religions wouldn't be there. And on Friday night was catechism, and what he had were five talks, two hours each. So it was a 10-hour catechism. And he would cycle through this over the course of the year. Remember, how do you baptize 150 million people? In our parish, we have much less people that, that are looking for baptism. I don't think 150 million could fit in here. <laughs> Throw them in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so his catechism was necessarily much quicker. Five weeks. And that's, that's, that's the catechism. They were real catechisms, so two hours each every Friday night, and he would cycle through them over the course of the year. So he'd end up hitting about, what's that, 10 catechism courses per year. I imagine that you would take nights off for things like Pascha, but that's not very much. 10 talks a year, 10, sorry, cycles of catechism each year. On the weekend, he did three sermons. He did one sermon at Vigil, where he talked about uh, ethics and the virtues. He did, one, he did two, two sermons at liturgy. One he did straight after the gospel, which was about the gospel reading, and then one at the end of the liturgy, which was about the epistle. He also, during what we call the um, concert, which is um, while the clergy are communing, during that time, he would have someone reading scriptures, just continuing on. Wherever we got, got to from last week, we'll start reading from there, and we'll put a marker wherever we stopped and continue reading from there next week. Uh, near Christmas and Easter, he'd have talks on the sacraments, he'd invite parishioners and newly baptized people, and he'd tailor those talks to his audience. And he also had co-workers, because he understood that he couldn't do it all. He needed co-workers, he needed help from laity, um, trained laity. They can go to more places, they can, they're usually received better as well. Um, the type of laity was important. They had to be responsible, and they had to be educated. They had to read scripture daily. They had to have completed the missionary school. So you knew them after they'd finished the missionary school. The role was to ensure people came to talks, to ensure that catechumens and newly baptized were settled in their church community. Their first task was to be on the streets around the parish building, inviting people to come in. Um, and giving leaflets for around specific topics. And for those who are really interested, you give them a gospel, copy of the Gospel of Mark. They're, if they seem really interested, there's the Gospel of Mark. Read it and come back. Um, and then they were given more difficult tasks, like preaching to guest workers, which you probably required a different language often. Um, preaching to meetings of non-Orthodox to explain the Orthodox position on X. Any questions about Father Daniel Sisoyev's work? Probably got time for one question if we've got one. Do they know who killed him? Or what, why? Yeah. What was the reason? Um, there was. Can you take one and pass it on? There was a. Um, there was someone arrested, and he said, "Yeah, I did it." Um, I forget where it was reported, um, but the line was something along the lines of. Um, we're traveling from the Caucasus to kill the damned Sisoyev. Okay. 
Um, so it was because of his success in evangelizing, specifically in the Islamic community, that he was martyred. What we're doing, by the way, is taking one and passing on the, um, not just the notes from this slide. So notes from this slide, you've got uh, lessons from Japan on it, and then lessons from Moscow on the other, on the other side of, on the other column, sorry. Then behind that, because you're going to need this for the discussion. Did we? We ran out. Let me. Good. And on the other side, you've got um, copies of the next six slides, which will be references for your for your own discussion. So our big question. A big question is, we have the gospel. We are now convinced beyond reasonable doubt that sharing the gospel is orthodox. Thanks. The big question, and it's a question that we usually have, is how do we do this? Particularly since you're here at tonight's talk, or you're watching this video online. Either way, you're already interested. So I probably didn't need to convince you that it was indeed orthodox. But how do we do this? And how do we do this in our own context? There's the big questions. How do we share the gospel in 21st century Brisbane, in the central south region, because that's where our church is? How do we do this for our own culture and our own people, so to speak, people who live in Australia? There's a guy called Darren Cronshaw, and he wrote this really fascinating book. And he talked about what are the ways in which Australians, historically, have accepted spirituality. And he came up with six ways. The first was as spiritual companions for the journey. So people who would walk alongside you and be like brothers on a journey. And this was a... Uh, he found a very common way amongst particularly Indigenous Australians. We underestimate how much Indigenous Australian culture has kind of permeated and become part of Australian culture. This is definitely something that is a, um, is a path to spirituality for mainstream Australia. Uh, companions for the journey. And then you've got something called chaplains for convicts, which I guess we can all understand where this came from, from the from the boats that came out and um, and brought prisoners out. We needed chaplains to look after them, to look after them uh, where they where they had nothing. Shepherds for settlers. So we're looking at the pastoralists in particular, moving on through our history. Advocates for the marginalised. So uh, the example that he uses is the Salvation Army, how you've got someone um, doing prison chaplaincy who is um, there supporting the person. I guess we could look at it like social workers um, who are there supporting them as they're going through some really tough times or who are with the homeless. The marginalised is anyone who is without standard forms of power. So um, not the 1%, not even the 50%, but who are well below that, who are um, disempowered in some way. So anyone that we would look to as, um, as needing a chaplaincy, nowadays there's a good chance that they're part of the marginalised. Servants for the needy, people who are in need, we can serve them. Homeless kitchens uh, probably fit into this very, very well. And hosts for a multicultural community to be a place where different cultures can gather. And uh, churches have been able to do that, G general Christian churches have been able to do that very successfully. So I've put these as a reference on the sheet of paper in front of you because we're able to use some of these. And when we're thinking about how is it that we evangelize, then these are going to be very effective guiding posts for us? How is it that we are reaching a particular community? 
Are they marginalized and need an advocate? Um, are they going spiritual but not religious is pro probably the one that is the one that comes to my mind. Needing companions for a journey. And so on and so forth. You can think of many more than I would be able to just here. So let's look to Australia first, and then we'll look to Southeast Queensland next. So Australia, prior to the 1980s, we were predominantly a diaspora chaplaincy. So various groups from various parts of Europe and Eurasia came out to Australia, and they needed spiritual care. And they were treated as people from overseas who needed spiritual care, like they would have received overseas. Which was right for its time, by the way. Nothing against that. And they focused on the needs of their own particular diaspora. They had trouble because of, well, challenges, let's say, because of different waves of immigration. And um, in some places, because of different places that they immigrated from. Immigrating from uh, European Russia is very different to immigrating from uh, the Chinese border with Russia. Produces very different people when they arrive. There was a focus on retention. Not evangelism, retention. Father Jacob Kochinsky is probably the most sacrificial of these who went around to various groups and he fought against schismatics and charlatans, uh, particularly in Brisbane. Particularly in Brisbane. Uh, and the, the focus on was on making sure that the flock, this existing flock, didn't stray, that we didn't lose anyone. There was a minimal pan-Orthodox cooperation, we have to say. There was a couple of organizations, and uh, aside from annual meets, that was pretty much all that there was. And there was reluctant interaction with hosts or the host culture. In the rare cases that English was used, it was used as a means of retention to make sure that people didn't leave. That changed a little uh, mid-80s and the 90s as well. In 1994, we had the what I can call the Anglican conversions. There was a group of people, a group of Anglican priests or ministers who were very sure that they didn't want to be in a denomination that had women priests. They felt, felt this was a corruption of the faith and so they, um, they saw orthodoxy and went to it. And um, five priests and one nun were um, thus joined what is, uh, what is now the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese of, um, of Australia. Others followed and were ordained in each major jurisdiction, and especially the Antiochian Archdiocese and our Vrokor Diocese. There was a Western Rite presence for about 15 years, for um, this, this ended up not bearing fruit, um, and the the organizer of that is currently in Scotland and, and is working on a monastery there. There was a growth in the number between then and now of English language parishes. Some of these have risen and fallen, others have risen and continue to this day. As you, I've put up the numbers of which all English parishes are currently in existence. Um, some are based on retention, some are based on keeping the flock orthodox, but I would say the majority, off the top of my head, are focused on evangelism, or at least on welcoming converts. There's a loose network amongst them. Uh, there, there was a teleconference between the various Rokor parishes, and in Melbourne there was a pan-Orthodox retreat among the English language parishes in that geographic area. Southeast Queensland in particular. In uh, 1984 to 1988 there was a Brisbane parish, this one, that did have an evangelistic focus. This was predominantly because of, um, of clergy from America who came over, and they were given the, um, I'm not sure if it was a directive or a strong recommendation. It doesn't really matter either way. Um, to make this parish a English language parish. And so they did. In 1986, it became the first English language parish in Australia. This reverted in 1989, but nonetheless, it, was, it remained the first English language parish. 
Um, in 91, the first weekly English language liturgy in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, that honor goes to St. George in 1991. But many did convert, and many did find the faith there. Even if it wasn't designed for that, it was still nonetheless successful. Uh, another in English language liturgy each week followed in 2012. 1984, those Anglican conversions that we discussed earlier caused an English language parish to be formed on the Gold Coast that lasted from 1994 to 2014. So today, there's four places in Queensland where all English services are served in Caboolture, Brisbane, Gympie, and Toowoomba, pretty much in that order. All right, so any questions about uh, Australia and Southeast Queensland? No, I've pretty much told you what you already know. <laughs> Can't argue with that, can I? I'm just wondering, Father, yeah. is it worth looking at um, what the majority of people in an area are thinking spiritually before we decide on which aspects of evangelism we to focus on? Um, very, very important. The profile and demographics. Well, there are some marketing tools that can be very useful. Like if you've got a area with a high number of uh, retirees, you may not use Snapchat marketing. <laughs> <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> well, it's unlikely to work anyway. Um, you know, there are some tools that can be used that will be very, very helpful. Um, knowing where a person is coming from very helpful to get them from um, to help their understanding. So maybe you have a high Buddhist population in a particular place. Mm. There are um, things from Buddhism to Orthodoxy that you know, that that are there are lines and bridges. Learning about them will definitely help. If you're going to a different area where Islam is the majority religion, or probably sorry, the biggest single religious group is no religion and going, what is it that they find valuable? What is it that they look to spiritually? And maybe the answer is nothing and they're comfortable with their life. In which case, go somewhere else. Um, but if they are searching, and many are, what are they searching for? Are we going for people who are searching or are we trying to attract interest amongst people who aren't? That's a very good question. And it's a question that needs to be answered before people make plans to do things. Because if you do advertising on TV, well, that's that's cool for brand awareness, but you're probably not going to get anyone to show up. Who watches TV? Sure. And lastly, sorry about yeah. this. Um, I've, I've been doing a little bit of research. It appears that the Greek Orthodox in America and the Antiochian Orthodox in America both um, are focusing <clears throat> on giving people the opportunity to speak their own spiritual um, uh, questions and, and experiences and thereby kind of get a toe in the door um, by, by inviting them to speak on ra on podcasts and, and mm. so forth. Not, not to sit them down and say, no, no, that's wrong, you don't <laughs> believe like this, but rather just give them a chance to, I don't know, in increase interest in spiritual matters, anything mm. deeper than, you know, posting what they act for, for dinner sort of thing. Uh, mm. yeah, so. yeah, Steve and Christoforo yeah. has done great things. Um, Father Finn, previously Adam Lowell Roberts, uh, with Becoming Truly Human. Um, I think those are the two that you're yeah, mainly sure. referring to. Um, they've been doing some incredible things. Um, and also the Areopagus, the podcast with Father Andrew Stephen Davick and a, um, a friend of his, uh, Pastor Michael Mansman, I think. Um, also, you know, they're, they're, they're each of them are looking to build bridges because we're not preaching into the air, we're not preaching to disembodied beings and categories. These are real people. And everyone who chooses to become Orthodox, real person who has their own journey, which needs to be respected. It's a valuable thing. And anything's more interesting than smashed avocado on sourdough, <laughs> <laughs> which seems to be what most 
posts seem to be about these days? Most posts are. are um, <laughs> gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of there is a lot of spirituality out there, as you know. Um, we just don't like to talk about it too much. Young to people today, I, I, I just had this from my experience. The young people today are mentally spiritual mm. and, and are very interested. And the questions about life and death and mm. what's it mean, um, you know, even asking your mate how, how they're going, are you okay? They're, they're fundamental questions. Mm. Um, but people are not joining us these days. Yeah. <clears throat> just. Um Okay, so what I'm going to do, because I've seen the time and we've managed to take up all of our discussion time with me talking. So I'll close up this talk and out of respect for your time, um, we'll, we'll finish the talk. And those who wish to have a discussion about it, see if we can lead a kind of, a, a kind of discussion about these topics and how we can put this into practice in our own community. And obviously, the discussion itself won't be video recorded. It's not a great way to promote discussion. Um, but we'll, con we'll conclude the talk. So what we've seen today is that evangelism is a fundamental part of being part of the apostolic church. Of the four markers of the church, it's one, it's holy, it's Catholic, and it's apostolic. And that apostolic part means that we were sent into the world as it says in John uh, 17, memory serves. And that means that we bring the gospel to wherever we are. We follow Christ's commands. This is not a competitor with theosis. Theosis is the process of becoming more and more like Christ. What was Christ doing but spreading the gospel, bringing healing to the people around him? We're being like Christ. Then sharing the gospel is a part of that and a necessary part of that. So evangelism becomes a component of our theosis, of our struggle for sanctification. Be ye holy, for I am holy, and go ye therefore into all the nations, are not, con are not contradictory commands. These are complementary commands. And what better place to do that than in a country where all the nations have come to our door? We do this individually and we do this communally as both ourselves in the world and in groups and as a community, a church community. This is how we bring the gospel to our nation, our city, our people. So thank you all very much for being a part of this talk. I greatly, greatly appreciated it. Um, we'll stand for prayer because this is the conclusion of our talk and then we'll continue with discussion for all those who are interested.